Jeremy Lachal. Do I pronounce that correctly, Jeremy, or not? No, oh, it's Lachal, but it's the Lachal, same. Lachal, yeah. Lachal. No, 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 I have to remember <laughs> this. I'll try to remember it. Jeremy, welcome. Welcome to uh, our annual National Library Conference. This time, a virtual thing. I said earlier, usually it's like more than a thousand people running around talking to each other. Uh, lots of theater uh, shows going on. It's a big, fun feast. And now it's, uh, it's all different. But yeah. still, there's a great program. The content is good. We have you, which is wonderful. Uh, and, and I want to give you as much time possible. So I'll do a brief introduction. I can tell that you, you, you have a master's degree in, in international law. You, you are a graduate of science in, that you did in Paris. But most of all, I met you in Lyon at the NIFLA conference. I think it was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But it was quite a while 20, ago. 20, 2014, so yeah. 2014, seven. six, yeah. seven years ago, uh, where I saw the, the, the flight cases and the Bibliothèque Saint Frontier at work uh, outside the building on the square. And I was really impressed. And I got to learn about all the things you do. And, and I'm very happy that you're here. I know you've done, besides building camps and refugee camps and helping people to get well, digital online and, 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 and be there, be seen, being recognized and everything else that you do. You also do this in poor neighborhoods. You do this in so many countries around the world. Uh, I will shut up now. I'll, I will leave it to you to talk and, and share your wonderful slide, Jeremy. Will be questions. People, uh, I will say it in Dutch as well. Stop your vragen in the chat and ik verzamel ze en dan kom ik terug aan het eind voor Jeremy. Uh, people put your questions in the chat for Jeremy and I will, I will handle with them, uh, deal with them at the end of the presentation. Jeremy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I, I'm trying to just get your video on because otherwise I have the impression, the feeling of talking to nobody. So it's a little bit weird, but uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here with you today. Um, uh, it's a strange, you know, I guess, conference for you. It's a strange year. It has been a strange year for all of us. Uh, but uh, I, I want to share a little bit more about what we do at Libraries for Borders and uh, put it into the context of what uh, we, are, we are going through uh, all together this, uh, uh, these days and these past months. So, I've been asked uh, by, by Eric to talk about our work uh, at Libraries Without Borders, in particular, how we build information and education bridges uh, towards vulnerable populations, uh, how libraries are levers of social inclusion and of collective narratives. So today we are talking about global warming, about pandemics, about uh, global poverty, inequalities. Uh, so our world is interconnected more than ever and faces global challenges for which the solution lie within each of us. And I think that COVID-19 crisis has reminded us uh, the importance of access to knowledge and culture while 7,500 million people cannot read or write and 50% of the world population does not have access to an internet connection. So all these crises and how all what we have gone through these past months uh, raise two issues, I guess. Uh, so raises like plenty of issues, but two issues that have become more and more central for our society and for our work as librarians or supporting librarians as we do at Libraries for Borders. And I will tell you a little bit more about the organization in two minutes, but I wanted just to to, to discuss these two, 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 two big questions for me emerging for this, from this crisis. The first one, which is uh, an issue that is becoming vital, is what we could call information security. Uh, so the concept is quite weird because it comes from like the, um, uh, the, 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 the computer science to refer to the security of uh, corporate information systems. So, let this along and compare it more to uh, what we face a lot in humanitarian context, which is food security. Uh, and uh, so it's like a reconstruct concept of information security from, from that point of view. But what we observe is when an epidemic such as COVID-19 breaks out in a refugee camps, the risk of misinformation and rumors 
can be more dangerous than the disease itself. And of course, if it's true in the refugee camps or a humanitarian context, it's also highly problematic in our wealthy democratic society facing infobesity, facing post-truth. Could not we talk about information insecurity when a president invites his fellow citizen to drink bleach to get rid of the disease? So the reality that we encounter in the field at Libraries for Borders is very often that the population we work with lack information about their rights, about their professional orientation, about their health, about their education. And as the amount of information produced every day throughout the world increases, so do the inequalities in controlling these flows, in accessing them and finding the right information. So with regard to this notion of information security, there is a need to build what we could call learning societies, capable of producing and sharing knowledge at all levels, in all areas, at all ages of life. So this is a concept that has been theorized by sociologists, by economists. But what I love into this context is this idea that education, lifelong training, professional development, and the construction of the, the, the skills of the 21st century become more and more central in how we conceive all the society and how we build the society of tomorrow. And of course, this position, the libraries at the center of the society, because it's not about only schools. It's not only about formal education. It's also about how we learn at all the ages and the step of the life. And of course, libraries are central into that. So all this is exactly what we try to do at Libraries Without Borders. We try to support local actors like libraries, civil society organizations, uh, by proposing them tools to bring this knowledge closer to the people, by breaking down the physical and symbolic barriers to access the libraries. So you have some figures about our work, but you know, at the heart of the world is this difference that you face, uh, I'm sure, every day in your work the difference between access and accessibility. Access, of course, the physical access. So I, I took this picture, which is like far from our European context, of course, but which uh, is a, a Rohingya refugee camps in, in Bangladesh, the mega camp of Camp Baz uh, of Cox Bazar, where we work a lot there. So of course, when you arrive in such a camp, you have like big problem of access to education and information because there is no library, there's no school, etc. So, okay, we build this library and we, we bring, we brought this ideas box that Eric talked a little bit earlier and I will show you some picture of, of the box later, but so we brought this library there. So we created the access in some sort, but at the same time, women, young teen, uh, girl teenagers, young girls were not authorized to go into these libraries because of religious uh, barriers. So we worked a lot in two ways from like discussion, I would say with the, with the imam and the local you know, religious authorities to let them get into the ADS box. But at the same time, we work a lot to reach them where they are in their shelters uh, to bring the information and the education resource directly to them. So we work in this you know, there are always are these two different things about like people. And I, I'm sure that you hear that like every day in your, in your job, people saying, you know, the library is not for me. And um, if it's not for me, for, for you, for, for who is it actually? So the, 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 the big and the central point of our work is working of course about access, but also on all this question of accessibility. And one way we do that uh, is to go where in, in places, so to bring, to create these bridges of information and education and to go to places where, which are familiar for people, where they belong, where they feel insecurity, so we can work with them and around this, uh, uh, this uh, bridge creation. So let me give you some example about all that. So I, I think I can 
and just jump into uh, <laughs> the ideas box. So in 2014, we created the ideas box and Eric was one of the first people to see it actually, because <laughs> it was really like the new concept in 2014. We created the ideas box with a French designer named Philippe Stark. Maybe you know him, he's a very famous uh, French designer. Uh, and when he was not like designing the yacht of Steve Jobs, he uh, accepted to design pro for, for us pro bono the, the ideas box. And the ideas box was created at the beginning for refugee camps. And you'll see like the story is great because now it's like a, a reverse innovation thing that some, some uh, one day a, a guy in a conference told me that uh, you, you, you are doing like reverse innovation. I was like, oh, I don't know what it is. Actually, you created this this, uh, this ideas box for refugee camps, and now it's very used in Europe in our concept of context of rural, rural areas or neighborhoods. So it's a way of, uh, of, of thinking about it. But anyway, we created the ideas box for refugee camps with this idea of bringing uh, a window on the world into these camps because people live in average 17 years in a camp. So once you provide food, you provide shelter, you provide health, People need education, people need access to information, people need cultural activities, uh, and there are no places, such places to do that. So the ideas box was created for that, to bring all this into two pallets. So you saw the two pallets on the previous slide, and when you open it, it turns into this 100 meter safe, safe space that gives access to tablets, computer, to a cinema, all the furnitures are inside, there is a generator for electricity, etc. So you have like a media center in your kit that pop up and create this uh, fantastic space, very attractive because of colors, etc. And we started in Burundi, in the refugee camps, uh, uh, Congolese refugee camps in Burundi. And very quickly the project uh, <laughs> started to scale in the Middle East, uh, in uh, Jordan, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in other places in Africa, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, now in Bangladesh, uh, in Colombia. And at the middle of all that, we had some people in France and in the US, actually in the Bronx, the New York Public Library, you might know some people there, you told, uh, who told us, oh, this guy, your, 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 your box, like, it's not only for refugee camps. It can be of great interest for us to reach people because we have hard time to get to, to some people who don't come to the library. So we start with them to implement the ADS box in many other, you know, contexts. You see some of them in France, in north of France, in the streets, in Marseille. You, maybe you recognize the Vieux-Port of Marseille. Yeah. Uh, we have now, I guess we have like uh, around 30, 33 ideas box now in, uh, in France. We have some in Germany, in Italy. We don't have any in Netherlands, so we would be very glad to explore that with you if some of you, of you are interested by the, uh, by, by, by the concept. And uh, yeah, and very quickly, actually, the, the ideas box... We, what, what, maybe one, one, one precision because it's important, but the ideas box was made to have like the, I would say like the envelope, the box in itself is standardized. So it can be produced quite quickly and uh, sent quickly in uh, any context. But at the same time, the content is highly customized. And this was, and this is still uh, now it's like the big challenge we have is that each project is different because each project will depend on what are the needs of the local population and what kinds of you know, service and content we want to deliver. Is it like access to culture? Is that education? Is that literacy? Is that digital literacy? Is that health literacy, et cetera, et cetera. So we have you know, 150 ideas box around the world deployed today and each of them is unique. And the reality of that is also uh, made by the local partners because the ideas box is always implemented through a local partner. So in a refugee camps, most of the time it's uh, an NGO or community-based organization, but in France, in Europe, in the US, it's always with a library. I say always, I shouldn't say always because sometimes we work with other actors at a local level, uh, most of the time it's a municipality, but sometimes it's not only the library. And this is one of the main interesting learnings for me. There are two I want to share with you about this ideas box. The first one is that, and this comes from the librarians we work with, this project deeply transformed professional practices. 
actually because it forced librarians to build partnerships all over the territory. And at some point, you know, you, you have this example on the top left of the, the, the city of Calais. And Calais, you know, has, uh, so it's a very poor uh, city north of France. You have like 25% of the people living under the poverty line. So it's a very, very popular uh, city. And uh, at Calais, there is this challenge of the refugee camps, the jungle, if you remember, now it has been dismantled, but uh, you have like all this uh, uh, pressure of these uh, informal uh, refugee camps in the middle of all that. And when they, when the city bought the, the ideas box, they wanted to use it at first for the refugees. And then they say, okay, but actually it can be very useful for uh, the local population. And now what they do is that they have the ideas box at the library, and they lend the ideas box as if they lend books, actually, but they lend the ideas box to other actors, like social actors mostly, but also high schools, like college, like uh, you know, schools in the city. And they lend the ideas box plus two librarians during one week or two weeks, so they can have like activity. So it's a way of you know totally transforming the fact that okay, as a library, we don't just we just we don't only do you know outreach activities you know, on the weekend, but we can have like this permanent, you know, uh, uh, de device or setup uh, that can be uh, propulsed <laughs> into, into a third party um, uh, uh, infrastructures. Uh, and we, but we don't only bring the tools or we don't only bring the resources, but we also bring the human resources that come with it because uh, it's always what we do, it's always about the facilitation. The tools is great, but it's also always about facilitation and how we do this facilitation. The second learning is about how much outreach activities generate social inclusions and ties between people. And then another example of Sarcel. So you have Sarcel on the top right uh, picture. Sarcel is a very poor <laughs> city in North Paris, in the suburb of Paris. And we worked during the summer, the first, the first actually implementation of an ideas box in France were there. And during all the summer, we implemented the book, the, the ideas box with the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the foot, at the feet of the big towers, you know, like the social, uh, the social housing. We had 1000 youngsters coming to the ideas box during the, wow. term, the summer. Among them, 700 so uh, 70 percent of them had never go to the library which was 200 meters away from it so of course you you can imagine all the mental obstacles that they had at the end of the summer they were all registered to the library but the thing which is even more interesting into that is that these youngsters were in this ideas box with their families because there was like mothers who came with like the all, uh, all, uh, the, the, the young, very young children. There were old people, old guys were like coming because they were interviewing this elderly to get their history. So there were like all these intergenerational activities in a neighborhood where there were not such things anymore. So because of this, you know, library, or this safe space getting inside the neighborhood and just like being there during the summer with all this activity, very attractive with lots of music. You had like Beyonce very, very loudly uh, all day long. And uh, you had like sport activities, you have coding activities, there's pick the painting, etc. All of this inside, like, and you could see that from your windows when you were in the housing. So you had like these links and people were coming to, 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 to it. So, and another example that I wanted to share in, uh, in the same spirit is what we did with, uh, uh, in Colombia after the, the peace treaty with the FARC. Uh, uh, in 2016, the National Library uh, asked us to implement 20 ideas box in the, in, in the villages or the place, the locations uh, of um, very near from the demobilization camps of the FARC. And you can see that some of them were in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> we, we came with like this very small boat and the ideas box came like this. The thing which is remarkable in this project is that uh, in most of these spaces, these places, the library, uh, the, 
not the library, the state and the public service were absent, had been absent for 30 years of war. And it was the, the president, the Colombian president chose to bring back the state in this uh, very you know, remote places uh, and not bringing back public services like police or administration, but first bringing back culture. And for that, he, 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 he was awarded by the, the, the Nobel Prize by taking like putting the culture at the center of the uh, peace building uh, process. The thing which is very interesting in this, I, I visited one of this uh, uh, of this ideas box in, in, in 2017, uh, and there was like some uh, high school, some teenager with their with their teacher were there in the box, and they were learning how to use the video cameras because there are lots of tools for creativity in the box, uh, including cameras, etc. They were learning that, and I, I asked one of them, "But why are you learning to use camera?" And he told me, "You know, we are going to interview the FARC because we want to understand why." They fight, they fought us during 30 years. Why they made like war? And you know this kind of uh, use of what library can offer as resources to try to understand the other, to confront the alterity, to interview it, to uh, is a way of you know uh, understanding how we can strengthen and build more, 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 more strong social ties. And there was like a very interesting uh, and scientific uh, evaluation of this project that shows that the ideas box increase participation in collective activities by 26%, increases conflict resolution by 15%, and strengthen youth leadership by 31% in these communities before and after the implementation of this and compared to places where there was no ideas box. So it's not the box in itself, the box is just a tool. It's how we, we can use the library to, you know, uh, hack the peace building process. And I love this, uh, this kind of idea. Uh, still on, uh, in the US, uh, in the American continent, I want to bring you to the US uh, where we have a, a quite dynamic uh, branch of libraries for borders uh, there that started to bring the library into the laundromats. So you know that in the US, there is this big culture of laundromats. Uh, and <laughs> like everybody goes to the laundromat, right? Uh, and according to the Pew Research Center, over 25% of American adults in 2019 did not have at home access to broadband services. And for those living in households without the internet, the libraries necessarily offering free online access, but lots of them don't go to the library, always the same challenge. So we decided with local libraries to bring the library into the laundromat. It's like a crazy program because basically what we do uh, is try to, it's a very grassroots uh, solution actually, because we leverage community-based organization, local libraries, <laughs> we, set up, we set up like a very, you know, you know, like a, a normal and like a, a very simple space with some computers, with some books, etc. a broadband connection. And people, you know, they wait for 90 minutes to have their uh, laundry washed, uh, uh, dried, etc. So they have lots of time. They are captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> the one we love, you know, when we work there. Uh, and the thing which is incredible is that, so at the beginning, of course, uh, you can imagine because we live in gender, in genders, a very gendered society. So uh, most of the time, the, the target and the main audience was, uh, were women uh, and women coming with their children. That's why we're, you have all these children on the, on the pictures. But as we work with local community-based organizations, they started bringing new audience, like adults, like uh, men, like uh, teenagers, and it converts the laundromat as a community space into, uh, in, in, into the, the neighborhood. Uh, the, the pictures you see there, because we have like, uh, I, I think there are 20 or 30 uh, um, spaces like this in different states of the US, but the, the picture you see them, see there uh, are, have been shot in Baltimore. And 
Uh, I don't know if you have if you have watched the the TV show The Wire, but it was in the middle of a neighborhood like into the wire. And when I visited there, I was like, "Wow, we are in the middle of the TV show." But it was a reality actually. And you have like this huge laundromat, and I I don't know how is it in Netherlands, but we don't have that in France for for sure. Uh, and it was like you know, it's like a bullying uh, a, a bullying player. It's like 300, 500, uh, sometimes 1,000 meters square space with uh, uh, with these uh, dozens of uh, washing machine. It's like incredible spaces and actually that as they are very big they always have a space where we can install the the, the library so it's quite a uh, a nice way of using you know this uh these you know spaces that exist and where people are again uh maybe a last, last example before taking some 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 question because i see that the the time is uh, is running uh is the digital travelers and actually since 2014 we have been working with this project to uh, to accompany um, French population first uh, into the digital tran transformation and support them in you know uh, getting the right uh, uh, the right keys I would say like the, the yeah the, the keys to use um, uh, um, uh, the, the the digital tools to do their administrative procedures on the internet to pay on the internet to protect their privacy uh, to uh, fight against cyberbullying, etc. So really like a, a, a kind of transversal uh, digital literacy programs. And basically it's based on an, a very simple idea of train the trainer. So we have created this pack of resource of, you know, uh, uh, turnkey activities uh, that can be implemented uh, by librarians, but also social educators or social facilitators on the field, uh, even if, if they are not like a geek or, 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 or technician. We have more than 2,000 digital travelers to so these facilitators in France who have trained more than 50K people. Uh, it's not exactly what I want to, to, to share with you, but maybe just like to, to, to give you a little bit uh, of insight about it. But we, since 2019, we have been working, uh, including with you, with the National Library uh, uh, Association of, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, to expand this uh, program at the European level and to enrich it with all the experiences from different countries. So we have Belgium, we have Finland, we have the Netherlands, we have Poland, and it's kind of... And, and, very nice, very nice project. You can find all the resources on this website, digitaltravelers.org. And I think it's not it's not uh, available in, in Dutch yet, but it will be in the in the coming months. And you 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 see like all these resources also in English. The the story I wanted to share with you is not exactly this one. This one is like the project. But when we created this project in France and we started to to implement it, so we trained like lots of people. And at some point we said, okay. That's nice, but how can we do it where there is no libraries or where there is no local association for with people to train? Because we need facilitators to conduct this workshop, right? And what are the places in rural areas where there is no library? Where can we conduct this workshop? Because people need this kind of resources and activities. So we started thinking about, okay, in the US they have their laundromat, which are like quite you know popular spaces where people meet, etc. What is the what is our laundromat in France? <laughs> it's not exactly the same thing, but we thought about the coffee shop because you know we have this culture of cafe in France. Uh, uh, and in particular in villages, in rural areas, uh, most of the time the last space of sociability or socialization that remains when everything is closed, like the local market, etc. Uh, so yeah, most of the time you have a church, but we are not very church uh, related as you understood. So the other space of socialization is the cafe. So we are starting now some digital workshops into cafe uh, in a very rural uh, setups in the south, southwest of France near Toulouse in Garonne. Uh, it's, it's incredible because what we try to do is to bring, so we have the space now with the cafe we have the resources with this kind of, you know, uh, uh, activities that already exist, which are totally open source and can be, you know, <coughs> can remix by people, etc. And then we need the facilitators. So of course we ask to, to some librarians of the of the of the region to come, etc. But 
it's hard for them because they are, they are already overwhelmed by the, 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 the job. So we work also with local uh, companies, uh, with one which is uh, named Capgemini, which is like a big uh, uh, tech company where they have a lot of uh, people working at Airbus, you know, where the planes are, are built uh, in South France. And these are the people who are going to go into the cafe and we are going to work with the local libraries to design the project, etc. So it's like uh, another way of including, you know, citizen participation, but also companies uh, uh, participation into uh, such uh, uh, an information and education project. So it was like uh, another example of what I wanted to share with you. Uh, maybe just before taking, uh, the, and this is one of the, the picture we took uh, into one of these uh, uh, these uh, these villages. Uh, just before uh, taking some question, I wanted to to conclude. Uh, I, I want to like give you like the big conclusion I had uh, written because it's not that interesting. Um, maybe it's and I think it's more interesting to to have like a a, a concrete discussion. But uh, at Libraries Without Borders, we are very interested by the work of Amartya Sen, maybe you know him, which is like a Nobel Prize, uh, uh, who has theorized this question of capability and agency. So the capacity to act and to be, uh, and to make free choices or informed choices to decide uh, of your future. And it's a very, you know, uh, different approach of human development that the the average one, I will say, uh, and I, I think that uh, this this idea that uh, it's not the accumulation of capital which is important for uh, what makes us as human beings, but it's more our ability to think freely, to inform ourselves, to train ourselves, to educate our children, and to decide the life we want to live. I think more and more people. Uh, understand that today and the crisis we we are living uh, uh, face faces with that kind of question so I think we are living like a terrible time and a terrible time in particular for information with all what is going on with post rose but at the same time I think this time is a great opportunity for what we do because and for what libraries are and should be in the future even more because I think we have into that, into what we do, we have maybe not the whole solution, but a big part of the solution. And I will finish with the word of Chris Boer, who is the director of the MIT libraries, who, who was saying like, she, had, she was proposing a vision in, in, a, in a recent report, uh, a very interesting report. She, she was pro proposing a vision of the 21st century library as I quote her, an open global platform that gives people access to information that can help them solve global challenges, such as increasing access to clean water or discovering new clean energy source. And facing these challenges of today's world, she insists providing access to credible information and the tools to assess, use, understand, and exploit it is what libraries, librarians, and archivists have always done, it's more important than ever now. And she finished by saying, I don't think we need to save libraries, but I do think we, we might need libraries to save us. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much. I gave you a little bit more time because I couldn't stop you. I mean, it's just too good. You know, you are one of my heroes and I know the organization does amazing work. Um, I have a few questions in the chat. Um, for once, eh, you said there's no idea box uh, initiative in the Netherlands. Um, so I would definitely be interested, but there's not enough time to talk about it here. What would it take to bring this to the Netherlands to, to have uh, to do to run a pilot here and, and on some issue? But that, that we need to talk about that at another time. Um, I know there's a conversation going on about this. Um, I have a question. It's one of the questions is from Mignon Middlecop. She says, how do you recruit the staff for the activities? You already said something about you give your own workshops, uh, but, but can you just expand a little on that? This is, this is a big challenge where, which we face is that uh, in many parts of the world where we work, there is no librarians. 
So when you go to a refugee camp, there is no trained library, and you know, with a, with a diploma or certificate or whatever. Uh, so uh, actually, our, our, our colleagues in the U.S. have theorized these terms of information warriors, and because you know, and I. I, I <laughs> I tease them by saying, like, in the US, everything is about war, you know, so we took the concept and which which is a little bit into information champions, we prefer that. <laughs> but uh, the idea is more like uh, most. So as I was explaining, uh, we are not implementing the project. It's more like supporting local players to that implement the project. So these are the guys, the local players who hire the staff. And what we try to do is to deliver some very basic, you know, library skills, library and skills. But most of time, most of most of the big part of the 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 the, 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 the training is about positioning themselves to let them think that they can be, or let them act as, you know, you know, uh, have the, I would say, like the capacity and the the, the confidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be facilitating, you know, because most of time what we observe is that you don't need to be a specialist of the subject to facilitate a workshop. And it's very true for digital workshop, right? Uh, but it's more about, you know, getting people together and say, okay, I'm at the same level than you are, and we are going to learn together. And it's very hard to, to, to have this switch of position. And so most of time, uh, you know, I, I would say like uh, something very, uh, very, very sad, but <laughs> and it's not always true. But most of time, teachers, for example, are not the best person to be facilitator for an ideas box in refugee camps. Was like because most of time the teacher has this very, you know, training of uh, descending, you know, education, in, and it's very true in uh, in Africa, for example, or in the Middle East where there's like this culture of the, the, the master who is like very, uh, you know, with, with descending uh, uh, education and resources. And it's switched. Uh, so most of the time, it's better to take like young people who are very curious and want to, you know, yeah. create co-creative people, etc. Okay, uh, I have one more here. I will read it out. I would imagine that the intention of bringing free and open sources of knowledge and information to place where this is not culturally accepted or the standard can create friction or challenges. Do your organization its projects encounter challenges with regard to friction? Of course you do. A basis of support for local government. This is a question from Ruth from Sichtenhorst. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I couldn't hear you totally, but I understood that. Uh, so uh, uh, there, there are lots of friction, of course. Um, I, I think there are two things to admit. The first one is that when you have a li when you create a library, you Make some some choices of editorialization. So, of course, uh, and we are we we so to to make these choices, we always work with local uh, actors. That might include some censorship sometimes, but it's not exactly censorship because we you know if we don't work with like uh, dictators, dictators or whatever. But always there, 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 there is always a part of self censorship by local partners. You know, when you walk in uh, refugee camps in Bangladesh, of course, you are not going to, to show the origin of the world by Gustave Courbet. Uh, and you know that. So it's part of uh, uh, local uh, and self-censorship, but it's more than that. It's more like uh, how you editorialize and what kind of choice you make. And this choice, we decided to do it like by co-creating with the local parties. And sometimes it takes very long time. You know, when, when we work with religious authority in Bangladesh to make them admit that the, the woman can go to the ideas box, at the beginning, it's a clear no, and it's like a no way at all. And then they understood, and okay, it was a little bit cynical from our part, but what we discovered that the, the men a large part of their work and the, that time was taken by doing like all the administrative formalities inside the camp for a unit, for unit here, like uh, filling forms, etc. So we, we explained them that it could be very useful for them if their, uh, their, their, their wife could know how to read and write so they could help them to fill this form, etc. So from one day to another, we had like, you know, 20 women came into the ideas box to learn how to read and write. And you know that when you start teaching people how to write and learn, you start like you opening the, the field of yeah. well, This kind of change uh, can take time, but uh, it's all about, you know, working with the people and not, you know, 
just giving them the tools and say, okay, it's finished. And, uh, Jeremy, you have to close down. I see a message that we're running out of time. I have to get you back to the Netherlands one day and, and, and have you for a longer period of time because there's so many questions. Thank you so much for your time. Talk to you later, my friend.